Hi, this is Tim Ackesy from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm pleased to be on this evening with Michael Coates. I met Michael in late 2016 when he came into my office to begin working with me. And we're going to cover what he does for a living, how he has applied everything he's learned. We're also going to talk about the value that Toastmasters has had for me personally and for Michael. So I would like to say hi to Michael and have him tell us who is he and what does he do for a living? All right. Hi, Tim. I am happy to be here. I think I have listened to just about every one of your podcasts, and I think that you're doing an awesome job. So uh, happy to be a part of it. Um, so again, just a little bit about me. I am Michael Coates. For the last 20 years, I've been in the, in the financial services industry, and for most of that time, I was an investment portfolio manager where I basically invested the money uh, that our high net worth clients had or institutions. And then over the last five years, I had, trans uh, I had transitioned to a private wealth advisor team where we really focus um, on our clients in terms of financial planning, investment management, and risk management. And I really focus more on the financial planning side. Uh, I, I've got several professional credentials. I'm a chartered financial analyst, a wow. certified financial planner, and also an accredited estate planner. So wow, I know that that's a lot of alphabet soup behind my name. <laughs> mm. What it tells me is hard work and dedication when you get something in your mind mm. that you will pursue it. Some of those tests are brutal. You're not kidding. I have, I have a cousin who's in the same industry and I know mm. he's told me about those tests, but people who stutter, a lot of them are extremely hardworking and dedicated. And that's an example of that. Now your work requires a lot of talking right sure. now. It's zoom oriented or, you know, through, through a chat mm -hmm. at the same time, it's a lot of talking. It's important topic matter. Maybe a man and wife are going to retire Yep. and they're a high net worth couple and speaking is a premium. Let's be honest. Is that right? Mm -hmm. To clearly, yeah, I mean, say, I think you hit the, uh... yeah, mm -hmm. to clearly articulate what you're going to do with their nest egg. Um, mm -hmm. Now, when we met in 2016, you were already in your forties and we found that we went back in your timeline. We found things about stuttering when you were younger and then in college and those were still affecting you. And some, and some of you have heard my podcast, you know, that, how in my 40s do I anticipate and fear stuttering? Well, a lot of times it goes back mm. to previous experiences, sometimes as a child, where we develop a strong dislike of stuttering. Some people are teased, some people are bullied, but we have a reference for that. And um, is, is there anything you want to share about maybe some experiences as a kid or in college that you believe came with you into adulthood? Sure. Um, you know, as a kid, I think the first time that I can recall being teased was when I was pretty young. Um, mm. And I think it was at the uh, daycare that I had gone to. And mm. it wasn't the kids, it was the person's, um, the, the person's children mm. who were actually there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that kind of stuck with me. But, you know, throughout, I think throughout grade school and high school, I, I had kind of a slight to a moderate stutter. Mm -hmm. And it was really more situational, yep. like having to get up and to give a presentation or a speech kind of where the, I think, as you call it, the situational anxiety starts to really kind of ramp up. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, jumping into college, I can recall having to get up in front of the class and give a couple of different speeches and you turn bright red. And, uh, yep. you know, that definitely sticks 
with you. And then early on in my career, several of my client meetings didn't quite go as well as I would have liked. And so you, you know, I think you do kind of keep those things in, in the back of your mind and they will pop up at the most, uh, yeah. inopportune times. Right. Um, and people can go into my podcast and hear about specific things like timeline therapy and how mm -hmm. people develop specific sound fears, word fears, and situational fears, the psychology part of stuttering. Now, you had some very specific words that you routinely <laughs> yeah. stuttered on when yeah. we met. That's a reference. Yep. And this falls into that purpose and intention. Is my intention mm -hmm. to not stutter? If so, I'm going to change those words around, put some ums before them. What did you learn about addressing specific words and sounds? Well, again, so so I kind of came back to you back in 2016 when I had transitioned to a position where, as you said, I was going to be doing a lot more in terms of meetings and presentations. And one thing that popped up, uh, you know, typically during every financial planning presentation, we talk to clients about how to maximize taking social security over their lifetimes. And I guess it was something that I had stumbled on social security at one point and it was part of every meeting. And so it just became something that, oh my God, I've got to get through this. And I mm -hmm. knew as part of a meeting, okay, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And uh, yeah, it just kind of built up and built and built up. And you, you know, you definitely helped me to mitigate it by going and doing the fake stutters. Uh, I think I called up just a ton of different hotels asking about if they had a social security conference or, or mm -hmm. something along those, <laughs> yeah. a, 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 a along those lines. Mm -hmm. So that's proactive. You know, I use the expression mm -hmm. proactive versus reactive. Right. Proactive is I have a word that I have to use all week long and it bothers me. Mm -hmm. um, I fear it. I frequently stutter on it. Proactive is a combo of the cognitive part. You know, it all comes down to the meaning we attach to it. There's nothing special about S, social sure. security. Mm -hmm. It could have been a D word or F word for someone else. But anyways, the cognitive part, like what do we believe about stuttering in the middle of a meeting on the word is a critical thing to ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then the proactive part is calling like a bookstore and looking for books on social security planning. Mm -hmm. it's right there for the taking that's proactive. Um, you know, I'll meet a doctor who stutters on specific meds or tests that they have to talk about with their patient all the time, or the attorney who stands up in the courtroom in the morning and stutters on his own name and the name of his law firm and the name of his client. It's a tough way to begin the morning sure. every day in court. So we can remember these specific words. So we did a lot of CBT, cognitive mm -hmm. be behavioral therapy, as well as speech techniques. I like to put them together for the, for the special sauce. Hmm. Um, what was really cool is by 2017, you were already in Toastmasters. Right. And you, I'm going to hint that you had the courage to speak at my raise your voice nonprofit meeting by January of 18, I met you the end of 16. So basically a year later, you were willing to stand in front of an audience of 90 people and disclose you stutter and talk mm -hmm. about yourself. It was really cool. Let's jump in here about Toastmasters. Okay. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia in 87. And I can tell you from sixth grade, through undergraduate, so that's three years of middle, four years of high, four and a half, five years of college because of my stuttering, I dropped some classes. Mm -hmm. So that's three, seven, 
uh, 12 years, I did everything to not speak in front of the class. I faked sick. I went to the bathroom. In some cases, I took a F instead of talking in front of the class in high school. I had a phobia. I went to, I got to Atlanta in 87, um, wicked stutter and trying to find employment. And I learned of this thing, Toastmasters. And the local chapter, I went down to it. I was wearing a hockey jersey from the old Atlanta Flames and a pair of jeans. I walk into a boardroom with paneled walls and oil paintings. And it was a very formal room. Everyone was either in a sport coat or suit and tie, realtors, attorneys, professionals. And here I am. And I also arrived late. At the end of the meeting, they said, we have a guest here. Would you please stand up and introduce yourself and tell us why you're here tonight? I remember the moment as I stood, the room was spinning like a hurricane. And I remember vomiting out something like, m m m m my name is Ted, 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 Tim, Ted, Ted, I stutter and I'm here for help with my speech. Mm -hmm. I slumped down in my chair. The meeting came to an end. I thought for sure they're never going to want me to come back because I just dropped a bomb in this room. Well, not one, not two, but three people came up and said, it's nice to meet you. We hope you'll join. And the third person said, I would like to be your mentor. And I want to cry right now. These were complete strangers. That's Toastmasters. Complete strangers encouraging me to join. And then one person saying, I personally would like to mentor you. I was like, oh my God, this yeah. is amazing. It's awesome. What was your early, early, early Toastmasters like? So, um, you know, part of the, of the problem that I had or, or the issue that I could use help with is that, um, you know, I did have that anxiety of getting on a conference call or, or, uh, you know, talking and, and uh, just, just as, as part of like an open group. And you had really talked to me about how Toastmasters had helped you and that, if you really kind of want to slay the dragon, you know, getting into Toastmasters can you know, um, help out. And so I didn't, I didn't take your advice all at once. It took me some time. And so I think it was probably mm -hmm. June of 2017. I had gone to my first meeting and it was just kind of like you said, at the end of the meeting, they asked me to stand up and kind of say why I was here. You actually had already preface to me how it works. So mm -hmm. I already had a little bit of a spiel kind of all set. Uh, but 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 kind of the same thing, people would come up and say, hey, you know, that this group is an awesome group. And here's why. And I lucked out in that the group that I joined was very diverse. It had um, some some young speakers, it had some older speakers, mm -hmm. and in between, and a, just a lot of experience too. And so I had a mentor who, like you, asked me if, if they could work with me, and it was an awesome ex, uh, ex, uh, experience. And, um, you know, typically, when you start inside of Toastmasters, there is a speech that you give that is called a icebreaker speech. It's the mm -hmm. easiest speech that you can give because you're talking about yourself. Mm -hmm. And so um, I kind of jumped that typical, uh, that, you know, typically first speech because you had, had kind of instilled in me that habit of, always saying yes, if somebody asked me to speak. Yeah. And so somebody had said at the time that there was a humorous speech contest. And I, I said, well, I think I've got a pretty funny story that I could, you know, say, I don't know if it's going to be any good, but I'm happy to get up and to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I go into the room and there's, there's 20 plus people 
And there's a lot of other people outside of the club to be there as advisors and, and to witness how things went. And I got up and I gave the speech and it went over pretty well. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually came in second, mm. uh, which is pretty good for the first speech you know I have ever given. Yeah. And um, it just so happened that the person who won this, um, who actually won the contest, he could not, or he had a conflict to go on to the next level, yep. which was the area contest. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know that there was a succession of contests. And so they had asked me, well, hey, do you have a conflict? Can you step in? Yep. And I said, yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, so I had gone back to talk it over kind of with the uh, mentor and we did some additional work on this, on the, on the speech. Yeah. And uh, she had actually put me in touch with other clubs to mm-hmm. go and speak as a guest speaker to get some practice. Yeah. And so I got a lot of great the feedback uh, that way. Yep. And I came back and I was able to win that next contest. Mm-hmm. And I went on to the next level, which was the division or yeah, the division level. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, I was coming back f- from a business trip. I, mm-hmm. I, I think I'd been in Tampa and I was mm-hmm. on the flight home practicing my speech. I was tired yep. and I said, I've got to go. And I, made it to the contest and this is a packed room it's probably 80 plus people Mm -hmm. and uh i'm exhausted and i'm like and right before it was my term i said hey it is your time make the best out of it and i hopped up and i probably gave the best speech i have ever given yeah and Mm -hmm. it was so cool because you know, when there's about 80 people there, there's a lot of eyeballs and, oh, yeah. you know, you can kind of float from person to person, but, you know, toward, I guess it was the end of the, of the speech. I saw a couple of kids in the back of the room and I just saw them belly laughing mm-hmm. with, you know, the story. Yeah. And it was such a connection that it was just a, a really awesome experience experience. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. was very fortunate to win because there were some really talented and Isn't really, something? And, yeah. Just, uh, you know, five or six months after joining Toastmasters, you're in a speech contest and you win a contest. Exactly. Um, for those people who are not in Toastmasters, you know, once you get into the membership, they have an extemporaneous part of the meeting where somebody comes in with questions. They might ask a question and then they'll say, Michael, and you have to stand up and answer another part. Like if you show up at the meeting and someone's supposed to give a prepared speech, but they're sick, they might say, Hey, is there anyone that wants to give a a prepared speech? Mm -hmm. I got to the point where I could create a prepared speech literally in three minutes And then the evaluator for every speaker, there's someone assigned to evaluate. Mm -hmm. I was always willing to evaluate any speaker. So Michael and I both had the same mentality. I'm going to go into a meeting and any opportunity they give me to speak, I will speak. And that really helps you to learn how to speak quickly to plan your words, but also it never gave me a chance to back down because I was afraid to stutter. (laughs) I ended up, I got my CTM, my ATM and my ATM bronze. The only thing after that is a DTM. Mm -hmm. And in my few years in Toastmasters, I moved around in Atlanta as a single and then an engaged to my wife, Carrie. So I moved around and I changed clubs a bunch of times, but I also went as a visitor to other clubs, which would force me to stand up and say my name, which was always a problem. But Toastmasters literally changed my life. 
I ended up going on to teach college classes. Hmm. And I frequently teach courses, 100 people, 150, 300. The largest group I've ever talked to was 1500 people and I was wow. at ease and Toastmasters made that possible. So it's a beautiful organization. You can go to toastmasters.org. Right now, everything is, is, is virtual for the time being. Mm -hmm. Now you've had to make a move during the pandemic to internet meetings versus in-person meetings with right. clients. Mm -hmm. Give us a quickie on what it was like initially to all of a sudden transition overnight to chat meetings, Michael. Yeah. So, um, it was a, it was a really hard transition. Um, you know, just, just by, I think by being in the room with people, I'm able to, I guess, kind of better read their, like, like, uh, like uh, their body language. And mm -hmm. when you go on to the zoom or like a webex it is um it's just not as good and i think just having the fact that it that you know that that uh there is a camera mm -hmm. on you and there's this whole construct of, of mm -hmm. like being on the line that causes some additional level of anxiety mm -hmm. and so yeah i i have definitely struggled with that. Yep. And I think I came to see you probably just after it happened. Yeah, we did a, a zoom based appointment right when that happened. One of the things most of you have been now involved in is kind of what we'll call a zoom room. Let's pretend there's four, six, eight, maybe 15 people. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the microphone picks up my voice, all of a sudden, I'm the major thumbnail in the middle. Hmm. Well, what if Someone finishes talking, I'm eager to get in. And it picks up my voice. I appear in the middle of the screen having a big stutter. Mm -hmm. That's when I, uh, 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 there I am. I'm like, whoa. The one time it recognized my voice was in the middle of a big stutter. Mm -hmm. And some of these people may not know I stutter. Depends on where I work and how well I know these people, or if it's people I work in Atlanta, if it's our team from Texas, who knows? Sure. But as a person who stutters, it was a brand new snake to charm. Mm -hmm. This whole WebEx and Zoom. And I've helped a lot of people. I've also encouraged people to use a mirror. I know you got into it. Yep. There's a difference between like right now I'm watching myself in my thumbnail. But if I put a huge mirror above my webcam, how is it different to look at yourself in a mirror than the thumbnail, Michael? Oh, I mean, it's totally different because you just have, as you had mentioned, I mean, I'm looking at myself now on like a three by a four kind kind of a thumbnail. You get, you just get to see yourself uh, just in a much better you know, in a much better light. Well, it's a larger image. Once mm -hmm. you've done it, you understand. Remember, two thirds of everything you learn comes in through your eyes. Sure. So as I'm watching myself talk in front of a mirror, I'm able to, I slow down, I execute better. I'm also going to notice a stutter coming and execute mm -hmm. the way I'd like to. Mirrors are famous for that use. Some people hadn't thought of using a big mirror. I did a YouTube video, April of 2020, as a lot of people who stutter went on to have to interview online, whether they're in college and they are trying to land an internship or people who are trying to find employment, you mm -hmm. can find it on the, on the internet. And I walked people through how to assess their thoughts and feelings before the interview, mm -hmm. how to reframe anxiety. And it shows me sitting in front of a laptop with a mirror above and beyond the laptop. So I found that to be very helpful. Now, one thing you really hadn't done until your forties was disclose you stutter. Right. Now, a lot of your anxiety, you know, they, we think of stuttering as a social anxiety. A lot of anxiety and fear and avoidance came from 
trying to not stutter. Correct. Trying to conceal it and not let anyone know you stutter. Mm -hmm. That's changed massively right. since, let's say, 2017, 2018. Tell young people and adults a value of disclosure, telling people you stutter. Yeah, I think I think for me, the biggest thing is that it puts myself at ease in that I, I no longer am really mind reading what these other people might be thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm doing two things. I am letting the client or the person know, hey, look, um, you know, here's something about me that I'm going to share. And so it puts them at ease, but it's really more for myself. You're right. Yeah. And, say, and say, say, say something more about that. It's for yourself to disclose. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the whole thing. So I was actually, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. I was reading that book that you had, had talked about the, uh, the, the fulfilling good handbook. Yeah. And something Classic. that, yes, yeah, something that he had, written that really stuck with me. He said that there is no anxiety without mind reading. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you know, he's exactly right. And absolutely. And uh, I'll give you kind of two examples. So the first time and, and, you know, I have told you that I have a business partner who I primarily work with. And um, I had wanted to share with him that I had started to work with you. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of, you know, put everything out there. So, mm -hmm. you know, he already knew that I had some uh, or, or that I stuttered, but I just wanted to talk to him kind of man to man. And the, the thing that you build up kind of in your head, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's that, uh, what do you call it? The fear, the, uh, the, the like false evidence appearing real. Yeah. The acronym um, for fear, false evidence appearing real. Yeah. So, so I had kind of built up this conversation that he and I mm -hmm. were going to have. Yeah. And I actually talked to him a, a, a or I had talked to him about it and I disclosed mm -hmm. and it could not have gone off better. Yeah. Um, he actually turned out to have a stutter as a child mm -hmm. and he had gotten over it. Uh, but then he has a child now who, yeah. uh, you know, stutters as well. And so it, it was a great conversation yeah. and it helped to put me at ease. Um, yeah. And, and really the second time was the first time that I had, uh, the first time I had disclosed to a, a, a client and that was a pretty big deal. Yeah. Uh, because I, you know, you had told me, hey, this is, is going to be great. And I was like, ah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But I was going out to see a, 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 a client that my partner had told me this might be a little bit of a tough meeting. Um, just just they're they're pretty quick. And mm -hmm. uh, so on the car ride there, I said, you know what, I'm just going to come clean and yep. disclose and man, the meeting could not have gone better. Mm -hmm. I was as smooth as could be. And I was just, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it, it yeah. was win-win that you said. Exactly. Som sometimes I stutter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can, like my very first podcast, April mm -hmm. 2020, is purpose, intention, and stuttering. If yeah. I spend my week, my month, my year attempting to hide the fact that I stutter, I lose, I lose right. energy to stuttering. Sure. Stuttering is kryptonite and it depletes me because all through the day I'm attempting to conceal it. I remember um, CNN did an interview of some people who stutter from the NSA, which was the NSP back there in like 88 when I first mm -hmm. moved to Atlanta, I joined an, an NSP support group. Mm -hmm. And somehow CNN wanted to interview some people and I, I agreed to do it, which I couldn't believe it. And I told the person, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I think about is how much am I going to stutter? Who's going to find out I stutter? What's going to be the outcome of my stuttering? It's all in what I thought about. Mm. And what's interesting is I didn't stutter. 
<laughs> the whole interview was was wow. seeing them. Wow. It's the first time I was totally open and honest about it. Yeah. But fascinating. So disclosure is really being studied a lot in my industry as a mm -hmm. very powerful therapeutic thing to do. And I'll tell the younger people who are listening, adults have maybe worked up 20 years of trying to hide it and it hasn't mm -hmm. worked. You're more than stuttering. Go ahead and tell people sometimes I stutter. Right. If you're applying for a job, wherever you see it will bring, put you at ease. And if someone else doesn't get it, Mm -hmm. move on. So disclosure. And then the other thing is, remember, disclosure shrinks the identity. If I'm trying all week to not stutter, my identity as a stutterer has a lot of energy. When I'm willing to disclose the I become more a person who stutters instead of a stutterer. So that is great to hear. Um, any sage advice for the college student who wants to go into finance business law who stutters any sage advice because you've already walked on the on the hot coals michael yeah sure i think um i think well in my case i wish that i would have or, or i wish that i could go back and tell a younger michael to try some different uh some some different speech to therapy when i was younger because mm -hmm. i had gone through a couple different a a a, a couple different rounds of it mm -hmm. and and i was in my probably early 20s and i mm -hmm. thought well that's about you know i've explored all that i think i can mm -hmm. and so i kind of lived with it and uh you know i i I look back and I think it really did hamper some opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it 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 did help to shape me as a person. And I think you had mentioned it earlier that that from like a work ethic standpoint, it mm -hmm. really helped me there in that I feel like I have to be better in certain things. Mm -hmm. And but uh um you had given me, and this is kind of a funny, but you had given me some of Tony Robbins compact yeah. discs like back in 2017 or 2016. Yeah. And I was listening to them and something that he said kind of really stuck mm -hmm. with me. And yeah. uh, I'm actually this weekend, I'm gonna give my second icebreaker speech. And, and so, you know, I kind of paused my time inside of Toast masters and i came back last to fall but um something that he said really kind of ties in with me and and he said that you know if you are trying to make a change and the strategy that you are using isn't working don't give up try something else yeah and if that doesn't work try something else like the definition of insanity yeah. And if that doesn't work, try something else. Right. Never quit. So, right. so maybe, maybe I want to lose, lose weight and get fit. Right. Maybe aerobics is not my thing. Maybe road bikes are not my thing, but maybe it's the spin classes, the mm -hmm. spin bikes, the indoor spin bikes with the disc jockey music and the yeah. competition screen <laughs> up there. My, maybe that's my thing. Just keep bopping around till you find your thing. Yeah. So Tony Robbins, for what some people don't know now, he is the number one motivational speaker in the world, the highest paid coach. He's coached Serena Williams mm -hmm. and multiple world-class athletes and professionals. Oprah. Their highest, <laughs> highest ca capacity. Yeah. Now, Tony Robbins' background is in neuro-linguistic programming. Mm-hmm. And he just happened to package the skill set and market it in a way that no one else has. And NLP is something I've studied. So you and I have comboed CBT, which is changing our beliefs, our thoughts, our feelings about stuttering, mm -hmm. as well as good old fashioned speech pathology. Right. How I want to master this word called social security. Mm hmm because during meetings, I would like it to flow off my tongue better. And you're entitled to that, mm -hmm. that you can do that. And you can also disclose. So 
that's an example of a combo. Get rid of embarrassment about stuttering in meetings and also learn how to mechanically slide out social security. So future directions for Michael Coates. Mm -hmm. Sure. Disclosure, AKA, well, which comes with that is acceptance. Mm -hmm. Accepting I'm a person who stutters, I'm able to go to Toastmasters and tell complete strangers I stutter, right. speak at a nonprofit, speak at moving screenings, tell people I stutter, be on this podcast, say I stutter. You can also continue to evolve. I look at acceptance as a toll booth on the highway. Once you pay that toll, then you can evolve. What do you see as some future directions for you to continue to talk more comfortably with Maurice? Man, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm going to continue to do kind of the path that you have put me on in, in terms of the toolbox of doing the fake stutters, mm -hmm. of doing the disclosure, of going to Toastmasters, you know, getting an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to speak. And then, you know, one of the things that you had talked about is the CBT. And really, you know, it is if you have a if you have a bad, like a bad stutter or something that bothers you, going back and taking away the meaning. Yep. And so that's something that I'm trying to do yep. more of. Uh, but 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 uh, I think just kind of chugging a a uh, you know kind of chugging along with mm -hmm. the things I have been and uh, you know con continuing to come into a CU. Um, that's that's kind of the game plan. That's great. You know, you're learning about, and I always talk about before the stutter, during the stutter, after the stutter. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to log on to a meeting with a brand new set of clients, customers, and all my teammates, and I have some anxiety in my body, I have strategies to reduce that anxiety. In the middle of the appointment, I have strategies to feel and talk the way I want. Mm -hmm. If something goes sideways somewhere, and I found myself avoiding or getting anxiety. I, I can go back and I can look at the experience and learn from it. That's like my talking about how it happened, not why. How did I get nervous mm -hmm. at that restaurant when the server came up and asked how I wanted my steak cooked? Mm -hmm. I felt a lot of, so there's a way to do that too, before, during, and after. I find it fun. I find stuttering like a chess match. I do. Right. And I find it fun to look at the inner workings, the structure of the stuttering. It's one of the words I use as the structure of the stuttering and mm -hmm. the strategy of how the different beliefs. So I admire you've been willing to read health, uh, self-help books, mm -hmm. join Toastmasters, get on phones, phone calls for self-therapy. And somebody listening here would, you know, they can know that we've gone six months or more without ever having an appointment. Right. During the time I've met mm -hmm. you, then sure. we might have a couple and then you take off a while, which mm -hmm. is a great thing. If someone sure. says, wow, you've been working in with him for, you know, four years, that's not true because there's long gaps where right. you fly solo. And then yeah, you so, come up with something and you want to tune up like I'm, a, like I'm your golf pro and you're going from a 15 handicap to an eight to a five, and now you want to start playing tournaments. Exactly. And, uh, you know, kind of one thing that we had talked about is those in-person fake stutters that I think are really powerful because, well, at least for me to be mm -hmm. able to look into a person's eyes yep. and, to, and to not avert my eyes as yep. I'm doing an intentional or mm -hmm. even if there's a, a, an actual stutter that comes on, yeah. you know, that is some pretty powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to joke and say that right now during the, the pandemic, it's uh, March of 2021. Yeah. If I'm behind my mask 
I rob people of seeing my big juicy stutters. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's a loss for them <laughs> when they're un unable to see my lips really blast out like yeah. bacon. I want but uh, on a serious <laughs> note, masks of, uh, I almost said a bad word. Masks have been very difficult for people yeah. to stutter. There's a couple of clear masks. One is called the bend shape mask and one's called, I think, um, smile mask. But they do a good snug fitting around your nose and on the sides, mm -hmm. almost like an N95, but people can see your mouth. They can see purpose and intention. So they ask me a question at the counter. They're wearing a mask. There's plexiglass. I'm wearing a mask. There's ambient noise. Right. But 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 they can see my lips are moving. It really mm -hmm. increases patience. Because I've been out on safe field trips with clients who stutter behind a mask, and sometimes people become impatient and try to fill in their words. But I think I I just went on a tangent. You're saying that you're going to get back to in-person voluntary stuttering, maybe oh, going yeah. to Lowe's or Home Depot or something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. walking up because the experience will be better for you. Exactly, yeah. I love it. I love it, man. Well, listen, I mean, you're doing everything. You're checking all the boxes to evolve. And I look forward to you when we can have more in-person things. Yeah. Uh, when we can have movie screenings, mm -hmm. when we can have big support groups and get you up in front of people. Cause I know you've said, you've said to me off, off mic here that you want to keep giving back. Exactly. Yeah. So listen, man, thank you so much for your time tonight. This was awesome. Awesome, Tim. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm.